I was in Norman last night. Tennessee goes in there 25 to 15. Kind of a misleading final score because the game was in hand, I don't know, midway, late first quarter, at least is what it seemed like to me. I give this game one and a half chalai on the one to five rating. Now, all the Tennessee folks who traveled there and the many millions more who watched at home disagree with that. You should. It was a five chalai instant classic for you guys. Tennessee has what most coaches are searching for. The vibe, the culture, et cetera, around Tennessee. First off, the, the tangibles, like Nico Iamaliava running around there and completing passes, that is a quarterback with elite tools. So they've got that, and most people don't even have that. But they've also got a high-end offense, uh, one of the best play callers in the country who happens to be your head coach. But now they've got great defense over there, great to elite at times defense. I don't throw elite around lightly, but it's a really, really high-end defense, and they've got full program buy-in. Now, these sorts of things are the sorts of things that every coach preaches at his press conference when he gets introduced. These are the sorts of things in spring ball and coming out of spring. Everyone swears they've worked on and they've gotten better in. You know, everyone's put on 5 to 10 pounds of muscle. Everyone feels closer this year. Guys are spending a lot more time with each other off the field. No one spends less time with each other off the field. No one loses weight. And no one has worse culture, at least they don't admit it, but a lot of them do in reality. Uh, Tennessee is trending in the opposite direction. So I know most of you watched the game last night. This is not a recap show in terms of us you know, showing the replay over here on a video board or anything like that, but my goodness. I mean, I bring a guest in here every Sunday night. Colin and Jesse, you can go ahead and tell us. She doesn't have to wait long. Oklahoma's offense was so bad. I took notice, you took notice, but someone else took notice, and her name is Sarah McLaughlin. They were held to 98 yards, Oklahoma was, through three quarters. Oklahoma, 98 yards through three quarters. At home, SEC opener, the flyover, celebrities in town, everything. I will now read dramatically the drive chart through those first three quarters. <coughs> oh, paper pop. Turnover on downs, three and out. Interception, field goal, woohoo! Punt, fumble, safety, three and out, fumble, Three and out, three and out, three and out, punt. The game's over. We're headed to the fourth quarter, and we're going to make the score look a lot better than it was. On uh, 15 first down plays, they had seven total yards. They had three turnovers. They had a safety, and they averaged 1.1 yard per carry the entire game. Tennessee lived in the backfield. It might as well have been Knoxville West. Three sacks, 11 tackles for loss, four QB hurries, Oklahoma. Three of 15 on third down. We could go all night, immunity. Uh, 36 total rush yards Oklahoma had at home. Offensive line got assaulted and abused. You had a quarterback go into a shell and got benched. And I know we're kind of talking about it like it's an NFL game, and this sounds pretty heartless, but, man, it is is tough. It was kind of jarring to watch. And it was in Norman. And mind you, I was at the game where Spencer Rattler once upon a time got benched for this kid named Caleb Williams when he came in and won the Red River shootout. And so I've heard an Oklahoma quarterback sort of low-key get booed. And I heard it last night. And you may not have been booing Jackson Arnold, or maybe you were, maybe you were booing the coach's decision to keep him in, whatever the case may be. Um, We come out of the game, and and Brent Venables just immediately in the post-game presser, yeah, quarterback, quarterback jobs up for grabs. Like, whoever wants it, Hawkins. It's got to be the guy, by the way. Like, there's, no, there's no battle. There's no mystery. He's got to be the guy. Oklahoma put up a garbage time touchdown late, and there was a pretty enthusiastic cheer from the crowd, not because it was getting them back in that game, but because he's the only hope they have for salvaging a season. But we talk about winners on the show first. And Tennessee won this game pretty emphatically, one of the biggest 10-point blowouts I think you'll ever see in college football. And yet, if I were to go back Friday and everyone's arriving in town, <clears> or <throat> everyone's getting off work, and they're, they're headed home, and they're getting ready for the weekend. And I said, hey, I'm back from the future, and I got some news for you. I've seen the game. I've seen it play out. I'm not going to spoil the ending for you, but I am going to give you some numbers. You would think I'm holding padlock stats in my hand. If I told you Tennessee was going to put up just 345 total yards, they're going to turn the ball over twice, and they're going to be capped at 25 points, you would have thought, boomer. And then someone else in the room would have echoed sooner. That's the recipe for an Oklahoma win. You didn't go in there and torch them. You didn't go in there and go up and down the field. Nico was largely held in check, and he apparently turned the ball over a couple of times. And yet, 
The game not only didn't go your way, it's never even in doubt. It's never even in question. And frankly, a lot of those offensive numbers look relative to Tennessee's totals so pedestrian because they knew they didn't have to do anything else. I was at the Michigan-Penn State game last year, you know, the one where they ran like 83 times in a row. And so I don't doubt Michigan could have done more through the air if they really wanted to and felt like they needed to, but they didn't because they went in there with the goal being win the football game and not let's put up X amount of passing yards. Josh Heupel figured out that he needed to do the same thing yesterday. I don't want to just overlook, by the way, how easy it could have been for a less mature coach to let that get away from him uh, because he can talk all he wants to about how this wasn't about him, and he can talk all he wants to about how he didn't ever say it was just another game, but in terms of approach, he was trying to normalize it, which he should have done. But man, believe me, that wasn't just another game for him. And it would have been real easy, especially when you know they can't do anything offensively, and you got a multi-score lead, and you got a video game quarterback, it would have been easy to try and go for the throat. And it's a little more high risk, high reward. But hey, hey, who cares? Like anything's going to happen. Well, a less mature coach would have done that. A less mature play caller would have done that. He didn't. And their stat sheet sort of, quote unquote, suffers as a result. They're taking on the look of a team that can do things uh, folks thought not possible at Tennessee anymore. We've gone through this before. I'm not going to go through it again. But I think one of the biggest hallmarks of a rapidly ascending head coach is stuff that's not in your traditional wheelhouse is rounding into elite form. Josh Heupel and defense have never even been in the same conversation, aside from what his offense does to them. And Lincoln Riley's kind of the same way. There are two case studies, really interesting what's happening in Knoxville and L.A. right now, because those guys are among the best at what they do on one side of the ball, but if you're a coordinator, that's one thing. But when you come, become a head coach, you've got to have complementary layers to your team or else you're sort of a one-trick pony. And you're fun to watch, but folks know once you get out into the deep end a little bit, what happens? Case in point, Lincoln Riley's Oklahoma teams. So um, we're a few years in now to what Josh Heupel's Tennessee teams are. And you're finding out there are complementary ways they can beat you. They can rip your spine out and hang 60 on you. They can do that, and they will do that from time to time. But last night, they didn't need to do that. You, know, you could look at that and you could say, well, Josh, I mean, come on now. The, 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 quarterback, the quarterback situation at Oklahoma made it such that just about any team would have been able to do that. Well, I'm gonna, I'll tell you what. I don't always believe in that, but I'm willing to bookmark that. I'm willing to bookmark it because I think the context of this game will make a little more sense down the road. Uh, there have been times where we've put way too much stock in a win, but I don't feel like we're putting too much stock in it. I'm looking at the odds market right now. Tennessee still has the fifth best odds to win the SEC. They didn't vault up to number one or number two. Uh, JP poll Tuesday night, they're not going to vault up to number one or number two. In fact, opinion, around here at least, of Tennessee will be largely unchanged. We already thought they were really good and they were bordering on that tier one status and that's where they are. But I think long term, I'd be, I'd be very excited about this. Uh, because you got to not even so much as have to really get your hands dirty, but you got to experience winning without your fastball. And you know you're going to need it someday down the road. If you get where you want to get, you know you're going to need it. And so it was a really big deal. Now, I can tell you the TV cameras, I'm not sure what they captured because I wasn't watching, but I was on the field after the game. I followed Hypel around. I was, I was headed towards Tennessee's like locker room area and tunnel anyway. I, again, I don't know what got captured. I tried to capture as much as I could in the Instagram story, and some of it is still there now. A lot of energy. A lot of energy. A lot of, uh, I'll tell you what the vibe is around Tennessee right now. The vibe is they make sure when they're in public view, they're professional, and they make sure that they don't have an ear-to-ear -ear grin because they're not taking anything for granted. They can't. They haven't ever been there before. So there's no complacency. There's no entitlement. There's nothing like that. There's just hunger. And there's just like an animalistic pursuit of what you're hungering for and stuff you hadn't had there in a long time. But then when you get behind closed doors, then you feel it come out a little bit. And on the road, when you're in these post-game environments, the walls are a little thinner. You know, when you're at home, you get these palatial locker rooms and oftentimes they're part of this, this new construction that's happened. And you're not even within earshot of the public. You're in a broom closet on the road. And so a lot of times, 
you can hear in those locker rooms. A lot of times when you're in a visiting coach's post-game press conference, you can hear. And uh, so you could hear a lot. You could hear a lot, suffice it to say, of what was happening last night in Oklahoma, or no, Tennessee's locker room. But I thought the best piece of content that was produced last night, aside from the football game itself, came from their locker room. I, I didn't have Colin play it because it's a little bit lengthy, but I want you guys to go out of your way to go look at the video of Tennessee football posted on all of their socials last night. It's just Heupel's post-game speech, and it's not, yeah, and I, it, it's not fire and brimstone. It's not, you know, 47 expletives. It's not music bumping in the background. That came later. But it's just an appreciation of a team that never had to have the obvious spoken to it. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty mature team. No one had to tell them, hey, you, you know he used to coach here? Do you know he played here? Hey, do you know how it ended for him here? Boy, I bet you guys really want to get one for coach, don't you? No one had to do that. This is not elementary school. No one had to do that. But at the same time, there was a little reciprocation on the back end of the fact that even though I never made this about me, and he's right, that wasn't the, I wasn't the theme around there all week last week. Even though I didn't make it about me, it was very noticed by me that you guys had a little extra about yourself tonight. And the reason I mentioned that Tennessee's got what a lot of coaches chase is because of that stuff. That's very, very intangible. It is unquantifiable. There's no odds maker out there that says Tennessee's another point and a half to a point and three quarters better because that exists on their team. I just know they're better because that exists on their team. Uh, Oklahoma's in a bad place right now. Uh, but I think that's obvious. So I'm trying to, trying to decide how to properly phrase this Oklahoma is in a bad place offensively because of the quarterback position. But here's the difference. Like Auburn, for example, Auburn came into this season knowing they didn't have much of anything at quarterback. You did not. You came in here and the guy that you handpicked to be the future of your program, that was the guy who was going to start for you. The guy that you watched Dylan Gabriel walk out the door and say, don't worry, we've got this guy. That guy failed you. He wasn't what you thought he was going to be. Jackson Arnold was not what I thought he was going to be. I hate that because even though we are in the NIL era, I don't believe in talking about college football players like they're NFL players. Uh, you know, there, there's like a person there. That's not a commodity. But at the same time, this is major college football and it's the real world. And for whatever reason, it hasn't clicked. It may not be all on him. That's why I say for whatever reason, it hasn't clicked. But you cannot begin to imagine how much bigger a gut punch it is when you thought you had the guy. Because thinking you've got the guy means you don't necessarily prioritize going and getting another one because you've got this one, and now we're building around him, and now we're trying to make our team complementary to our foundational piece, and that's the quarterback, and then you realize what your foundation was, and it wasn't much of anything. And that, there's no getting that back. Like, I don't know how you watch what happened last night and watch him get benched, and watch how just inexplicably horrific that offense was, and ever think that, well, he'll round into form. He won't. Not at Oklahoma, he won't. Uh, that's done. That's hard to watch. I mean, I've, I've been out in California watching that dude dominate Elite 11 in high school, and he commits to Oklahoma. And he's sitting on the bench, and yet you're, you're slowly and surely building towards the Jackson-Arnold era. You guys know it at Oklahoma. That's why, that's why you're so down today. Uh, you should be down. This is not an easy pill to swallow. Defense is really, really good there, and it just didn't matter. It's like the total inverse of the LSU conundrum last year. LSU's got a literal Heisman Trophy winning quarterback on their hands and can't get to double-digit wins because they can't stop anything because their defense is terrible. Of all things to have let you down at LSU, defense. Well, think about what Oklahoma football has been this, this millennium. Of all the things to let you down there, offense is what ends up letting you down. And defense is what keeps you in the game and gives you an opportunity. I will finish this the same way I started. Think about how many teams we say that about. How many teams out there over the course of any given year, any given five-year period, have it pretty well figured out on one side, but the other side of the ball can't get out of its own way? And you realize, I got half an elite football team here. I got half a championship contender here. Tennessee's got a whole contender. They got a whole contender. 
you'll never hurt for points with Josh Heupel as your man, but now you'll also never hurt to get a stop when you need it with Josh Heupel as your man because he's hired the right way, they've recruited the right way, they've developed the right way, and I wholeheartedly agree with what he said last night. He said, we played well tonight. Our best is still way ahead of us somewhere. He is right about that. The other thing that we cannot know about Tennessee yet is will they continue to get better? Another thing Josh Heupel said last night is the best of the best, one of the hallmarks, one of the commonalities is they continue to get better. So once again, we see every year some teams peak in September. Some teams have about 10 weeks worth of gas in a tank that needs 13 or 14 weeks in it. And then there are some teams that separate themselves from the pack in November. Tennessee's got the pieces to be a November separation team. They will probably be in the playoff. At this point, it would be hard not to envision them in the playoff, but anything could happen. But uh, making noise once they get there, that's what we're looking for. 